That'd be a great story for Channel 9 investigator report. I hope you take this and uh, make some head spin. What is really making it so difficult to buy a property right now? We were walking away just knowing we were going to get outbidded. Every time our insurance has been canceled, it's been simply a letter in the mail that says we're no longer going to carry you. The person that was in Iraq was there that night. It's not just the alcoholism, I've got to figure out my PTSD. We don't have any secrets at Eyewitness News. We like to tell you how we came up with the information, who we talked to, who we tried to talk to, and that's important. We want to show you how we came about that story. Who did we uh, lean on? Who did we put the pressure on? Why did we do this story? Hi, good morning, how are you? I'm good. Good, 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 good. Today we sat down for a phone call with Dr. Rivera Cruz, who is the lead doctor um, dealing with those who are suffering from a mental illness at the Orlando VA. So Dr. Rivera Cruz, thank you so much. I know you are like the man out there and super busy, so I totally appreciate you taking time to kind of do this pre-call um, so I can kind of share with you what we're trying to do and where we're hoping that you all will be able to help us sort of illustrate the story that we're trying to tell about veterans here in our area as it relates to mental health. We haven't had a lot of dealings with the Orlando VA. This is a new relationship for us. It took quite a while uh, to nail down just this phone call because Dr. Rivera Cruz is busy. Um, as we learned during the phone call, they are dealing with and um, helping a significant number of veterans here in our community. And so that's one of the things that we'll talk to him about um, when we sit down with him next week. Hello. Part of the reason the pre-interviews are so important is so that you can gain an understanding from both sides what where the reporting is going. Because the VA had a clearer understanding of what our reporting was going to be about, they offered up someone who we didn't even intend to interview and she turned out to be a critical part of our reporting and that's Dr. Bridget Lingtree. I'm a clinical psychologist. I am the domiciliary section chief. So I run a 116 bed program split up between Lake Nona and Lake Baldwin for veterans who need services, more intensive services than outpatient and come to stay with us for 45 to 90 days to receive holistic care. Give me an example of how someone would end up at your facility. Veterans can go through any of their service providers. Any VA employee can put in a consult for a veteran or they can call themselves. They can call our screeners directly and self-refer. One of the things we learned from Dr. Bridget Linktree is that once a veteran is accepted as a resident at the domiciliary, they are put on a plan. That plan is to get them from the beginning of their treatment while at the domiciliary, but the plan is also set up to help them with outpatient treatment once they leave the domiciliary. That was very eye-opening for me because one of the things that you will hear from mental health advocates and even uh, people who advocate uh, on behalf of people who need drug and alcohol treatment is that when they're in a facility getting treatment, the treatment must continue because um, they will need ongoing care after. And so one of the things that they do at the domiciliary is set up a treatment plan from the beginning of the veteran being enrolled there until the end, even up until the point of referring them once they leave. One of the reasons we embarked on this journey of reporting on veterans and mental illness is because of the story of Stephen Haskins. Take me through some of what you saw while you were in Iraq. Um, we were there during the uh, surge or the push for Baghdad um, that Bush did in, in August of 2007. Um, we uh, were route security, um, QRF, uh, Quick Reaction Force, and um, I was myself a 50 cal gunner, um, so a gun that's a little bit bigger than me lost uh, some a really good friend um, in the first few days um, knew it was going to be a long year what do you remember about that day I remember my gun truck uh, commander asking me um, 
Are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm like, um, and everything was just ringing. Uh, you know, it was just ringing. We did a story a couple of months ago about the overarching increase of people in our local community who are living with a mental illness. As part of that reporting, we highlighted Stefan Haskins because he had an encounter, a near deadly encounter with local law enforcement. Um, and it turns out that it was all sparked because at that time, when he had the encounter with law enforcement, he was suffering from a PTSD episode. You encountered Orlando police. What happened? What do you remember about that day? Or do you remember anything? Um, honestly, I only remember waking up. Um, I wouldn't even say waking up. I feel like I was looking at myself uh, from third person. Um, I remember um, we had gotten ambushed. And uh, I had um, ran back into my bathroom. And like I said, it was all like third person. And I saw myself, you know, like, like fire a few rounds, like, like get out, get out, like warning shots. And I had my dog, that, like, in my mind was my battle buddy. So it was like a, my, a, like psychosis. And never in my life have I experienced a real flashback like that. I got shot through my, um, the top of my head. Uh, I got shot through the bottom of my mouth. That bullet bounced around, I swallowed it. Orlando police didn't know Stefan was reliving that grenade attack when fireworks woke him up and he went into combat mode running through his neighborhood with his gun and dog in hand. Talking to Stefan put a face on this story, the significance of the story. We could have sat down and talked to doctors, psychiatrists, um, any number of officials, but this is the type of story where it's going to be most impactful when we hear from real people, real people who are living with a mental illness, real people who have um, not been willing in the past to get the help that they need. Um, people need to hear the real stories. I need help. And um, as soon as I got here, my biggest thing was, it's not just the alcoholism, I've got to figure out my PTSD. Matthew Maddox was a bonus for us. Uh, we did not know that this interview was going to come through. When we did our initial conversations with the um, VA, one of the things that um, we asked of them is, can you find us a veteran to tell their story? They did. And his story, Matthew Maddox's story actually turned out to be a very critical piece of our reporting because I believe that his story will resonate with so many more veterans. Tell me what it was like serving in the military. I signed up when I was 18 years old. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up yet. And it seemed like something fun to do. I like the idea of serving my country. Um, and I like the feeling of, of belonging, you know, being part of a unit, being useful in something, you know, greater cause. So that's basically why I joined. What happened during your tour of duty do you believe caused your PTSD? I think when we were involved in a two front war with Iraq and Afghanistan at the same time, our um, our resources were severely limited and so these soldiers that had never gone a lot of them were in higher ranks of the military you know sergeants major platoon sergeants first sergeants things like that and all of a sudden they're looking at a, at a combat mission and it's a whole different mindset from you know helping out the state and you know, they, they sent us to Fort Dix for, I think it was six weeks in lieu of MP training, military police training. And because that's what the Army needed. They needed us to go over there and, and secure the uh, Bagram Air Base. And 
So not only were we in a situation where we never really anticipated having to go to combat, but also all of a sudden the thing we were trained in, which was aviation um, uh, anti-aircraft, um, wasn't needed over there. Afghanistan and the Taliban do not have a standing air force. So they retrained us and reclassified us into MP. So it was kind of like a, a double whammy, you know? So we're stuck in a combat zone doing a job that we got like the quick down and dirty training for and, you know, in charge of the entire base, making sure people, the, the civilians and the military on the base are safe. It, it, was, it was startling to see, for me, the, the way the Afghanistan people lived. Um, I'm a big history guy. Um, Russia, the USSR, the Soviet Union tried to take over Afghanistan back in the 80s. They failed. That's where all your Rambo movies come from. And so basically they decided, you know, if we can't have them, then nobody can. So they, I think at last count, it was over 9 million landmines in Afghanistan. Um, and they're all over the place. And it's been 40 years now. And so the landmines, the springs and everything inside of them deteriorate. And so the landmines start to quote unquote float to the surface and all of a sudden a landmine blows up. The, just watching the devastation was the hardest thing for me. Uh, and I, I dealt with a lot of uh, nightmares and things like that. And so that's why I started drinking because if you go to sleep comfortably tipsy, you don't tend to go into REM sleep or anything. So you don't risk having nightmares. So, you know, it's a great plan until it doesn't work anymore. Here is a man who admits he allowed his masculinity to get in the way of getting the treatment that he needed and instead he chose to self-medicate with alcohol. He has actually received treatment through the VA at the domiciliary now three times. This is his third time going through treatment. He believes that this third time is going to be the turning point for him because of what led him to the domiciliary this time and it was a near-death experience where he was caught drinking and driving with this 15 year old daughter in the car. I terrified my daughter when I got my DUI. She was in the truck when I got it. Yeah and she's forgiven me for that. Thank goodness. How old my daughter's is she? she's 17. She's a junior in high school. How old was she when the DUI happened? Uh, it was two years ago, so she was uh, 15. How does that make you feel thinking about the what ifs? Oh man, I mean, it's just, I thank God no one was hurt, you know? I mean, it'd be one thing if I got hurt, it'd be way worse if I had hurt someone else, especially my daughter. And luckily it was just a fender bender, and it's, ironically, it's the best thing that happened to me. <laughs> because I was taking a lot of risks and the more you get away with doing that, the more you figure, figure out you can get away with it. That in itself becomes, you know, that, that whole risk taking behavior is actually a big sign of PTSD too, is, is because it's like you're lashing out. When I asked him about why more veterans don't get the help that they need, he said it's simple the training they go through. They are trained to be tough, to serve our country, to protect our country, to fight against enemy forces. The mindset is different. You're taught to just deal with it. And so when you come back, it's hard to flip the switch and say, wait a minute, I actually have a problem. I'm not okay, I need help. I literally called the, called the VA and I, and I just said, listen, you know, I, I need help. And um, as soon as I got here, my biggest thing was, it's not just the alcoholism, I've got to figure out my PTSD. Dr. Rivera Cruz was critical for our reporting because he oversees all of this. It was important for us to extract from him 
just how significant the problem is. How many veterans out there are truly suffering but aren't getting the help that they need? But on top of that, one of the things that I wanted to pull out of Dr. Rivera Cruz was whether or not the VA has the resources. You have veterans moving to our state in droves. We have at least 1.5 million veterans living here in our state, one of the highest in the nation. Is our local VA equipped to provide them with the treatment and the care that they need to um, manage the mental illnesses they're living with? On a day-to-day -day basis, um, tell me what you're doing in your capacity um, here at the VA. I'm part of a team uh, in mental health leadership. Um, we make sure we coordinate services for approximately um, 50,000 veterans that are currently receiving mental health services through the Orlando VA and all its um, different sites of care. Are there veterans out there right now who are not getting the help that they need through these programs and services? Unfortunately, that is true. Uh, that brings me uh, to um, the, the situation where um, a number of veterans with uh, bad outcomes, including death by suicide, the vast majority are not enrolled in um, services through the Veterans Health Administration. That's an unfortunate statistics, and that's why we make so many efforts out there in the community to try to uh, get veterans in, uh, to get evaluated and identify what needs they might have um, so that we can pair them up with the appropriate services that we have available. I think that's what has surprised me the most about researching this topic is the significant number of veterans who aren't getting the services and who are committing suicide because they don't get the help they need. Why is this happening? Yes, unfortunately, um, the latest statistic speaks about approximately 17 veterans that die um, uh, a day uh, from suicide. 11 out of those 17 are not enrolled in Veterans Health Administration. Um, so th they are not getting either medical or mental health treatment. Um, and there are multiple reasons from um, lack of knowledge uh, to um, you know, inherent uh, resistance. Unfortunately, as a veteran myself, I can tell you uh, that there is a, a, has been a culture of uh, resistance, of feeling like if you get help, um, it's a sign of weakness. How important is it, is it to have access to the services that they need? So for example, like if they live like out in Lake County where there may not be a big beautiful building like this, are they less likely to try to get the services they need? First of all, um, I can tell you that at least the Orlando um, area is, is blessed with so many facilities. We have four large medical centers, um, uh, which are here in Lake Nona, Lake Baldwin, Vieira, and Daytona. And we have, additionally to that, five what we call community-based outpatient clinics uh, in different um, areas. Dr. Rivera Cruz says the VA has a robust outreach program aware of the consequences for those who don't seek help. He has Stefan and Matthew as proof, one of whom now pleading with a judge for mercy as he goes through rehab for his injuries and group therapy. The person that was in Iraq was there that night and he was seeking safety. And the other now seeking forgiveness from his teenage daughter. Getting a DUI was horrific, but having to live with the idea of maybe I killed someone would have been way worse. And I thank God I didn't. Getting the news that I was just not going to go back was extremely hard. There were a lot of jobs lost during the pandemic. 5.4 million were women. In a way, it affects all of us. We always put both sides on the story because it's our job to get to the bottom line, to get to the fact, to get to what is truthful and what is the truth. So you've come to rely on us because you know that it's so important that we give you context, we give you accuracy. We just don't throw stuff out there without checking it, without vetting it, without making sure it's accurate.
Today we talked to Daniela, she goes by Danny. She is one example of many here in Central Florida of women who were laid off from their jobs. We know that there were a lot of jobs lost during the pandemic. We saw the unemployment numbers here in Florida and especially in Central Florida with our tourism industry, how hard it was hit. But if you dig deeper into those numbers, it was disproportionately impacting women. I and mean, what we found is we started digging deeper into the reasons behind that. It had a lot to do with uh, the childcare crisis that occurred during the pandemic, and also just the fact that the types of jobs that were put under strain and put uh, through layoffs, a lot of them were traditionally held by women. After years of making magic for families and creating her own, meeting her husband and starting a family, Daniela Armendariz lost her dream job at Disney during the pandemic. Very devastating, first being put on furlough and then, you know, getting the news that I was just not going to go back was extremely hard. It's a job that, you know, I put a lot of love into, I met a lot of people, I grew personally. They had to make a decision in their family of whether she went back to work in a traditional sense or if there was another way that she could make money to help support her family. Did, did it occur to you that it, it might be hard to get back into the traditional workforce or was it a possibility in your mind that you, that you might stay home back early on? And my, my oldest was um, doing first grade so it definitely meant like I needed to stay home with her. According to the National Women's Law Center, she was one of 5.4 million women who lost a job during the first year of the pandemic. That's one million more than men. Today we talked to Dr. Mindy Schoss. She is an assistant professor here at UCF and part of the research that she has been doing is on workplace stress. Of course, we know during the pandemic uh, that became a much bigger issue, workplace stress and how it impacts uh, the demographics that are entering the workforce and also the people who are leaving the workforce. Obviously, the pandemic exacerbated what was already a major childcare crisis and difficulty for people to try to manage the demands of work and family. Even before the pandemic, the, the childcare system was kind of a patchwork quilt of duct tape and hope. She says COVID forced many families into traditional gender roles, meaning working moms who perhaps had lower salaries than their partners to begin with took a step back from the traditional workforce, either by choice or by force. So I saw a uh, large scale survey done that suggests that one out of three uh, working mothers have either scaled back or left their jobs or plan to do so. And that's, that's about 8 million people. This is quite substantial. She mentioned today, Dr. Mindy Schoss, during our interview, um, that this has the potential to set the, the pay gap back by a generation and a half, meaning it could take over 130 years to finally close the pay gap. This is not just a, a woman's issue. This is an economic issue. This is a business issue. This is a societal issue. And when a large proportion of the workforce, women aren't able to participate, you lose expertise and knowledge and leadership and all the human capital. What color is that? What color is that? Green. That's green, so it's not red yet, so it's not ready. And another former Disney cast member, Savannah Daigle, turned to full-time freelance work. Yeah, at one point we were like, is this gonna be what we're making now, you know? But I never really thought that it would be a full, you know, full-time thing, but the pandemic really made that, like, this is the best option for our family, so that's why we decided to do it. Um, it seems like your experience is really positive, and I think there are a lot of positive aspects to this, but the other side of the coin is that, um, you know, this could potentially have an impact on uh, the pay gap long term with fewer women in the workforce. You know, it, it allows men to continue to get ahead and women will now have this gap on their resume if they do go back into. I, I can't really speak on the on the corporate gap because, like I said, I've never had like that corporate real real corporate structure. It's um, you know, it's it's been a lot of flex. And what, with what I do, we I set my own rates, so it's um, you know I'm the one deciding how much to charge. Um, so there's really a lot of power in that. Um, I think with the pandemic, with these more flexible like freelance options coming up, 
more women are deciding, hey, I can take control of what I make. Um, I don't need someone to tell me how much I should make. Hey, we're calling about your windshield. And they start telling me they can replace my windshield and I can receive $100. What these consumers don't know is that Auto Glass Company is going to sue your insurance company. Somebody's making money on it. A viewer contacted me about a phone call he got out of the blue. A company was offering him a $100 gift card if it could replace his windshield. He suspected something was way off here, so he contacted us. Hey, we're calling about your windshield. Okay, what about it? And they start telling me, proceed to tell me that they can replace my windshield and I can receive $100. They would pay you $100? Pay me $100. To replace your to windshield? To replace my windshield not even knowing that it was cracked or broke. I said, so you're gonna replace my windshield, don't cost me nothing, you're gonna give me $100, and that's all I gotta do. And that's when I called a buddy of mine who was in the glass business, he goes, Pat, this is, that ain't right, that ain't right. I, and he said to me, he goes, at that time, he goes, that'd be a great story for Channel 9 investigator report. I said, are you at a computer? He goes, yeah. I go, see if you got his number. And he said, look, uh, I don't have any cracks. It's not damaged, so why would I replace it? At that point, I said to her, I said, so it's like an oil change? And she stated, yes, every 16 months, you're entitled to have your windshield replaced. we tracked down Glass Replacements, LLC, at its Maitland business address. Todd Ulrich from Channel 9. I'm trying to find Glass Replacements. I'm oh, sorry, they're not in right now. It's a virtual office only. Checking corporate records, Glass Replacements is part of DNS Auto Glass Shop based in Arizona. Three years ago, our investigation found an independent contractor for DNS Auto Glass going door to door, offering free windshields. This customer was suspicious. Sensor Glass had just a couple small dings. Did it feel like a sales presentation at the time? It, oh yeah, and he was really pushy. She unknowingly agreed to this assignment of benefits contract. That's when the installer takes over the insurance claim. Consumers think that's a good idea at first because they're going to go and get all the money they can to replace your windshield. What these consumers don't know is that Auto Glass Company is going to sue your insurance company. We've talked to some of these consumers. They had no idea the Auto Glass Company was using their name to sue the insurance company. Critics led by the insurance industry say once that happens, some installers charge inflated repair prices, then threaten lawsuits if the insurer does not pay. These insurance advocates say we're all paying the price. They claim this is crazy. And who pays? If you have an insurance policy, you pay. End result is higher insurance premiums for all Floridians. William Large from the Florida Justice Reform Institute says AOB abuse of auto glass claims has soared. In 2012, windshield attorneys filed about 1,400 lawsuits. Last year, more than 27,000 cases. Insurers can face thousands in legal fees to fight each case because of Florida's one-way attorney fees. We checked. Glass Replacement LLC went to court nearly 200 times in our area after customers signed AOB contracts demanding insurers pay the cost of their repairs. This woman never knew she signed that kind of contract, and that's not all. Most of these individuals have no idea that there was a lawsuit brought in their name. We reviewed 30 glass replacement lawsuits. Only five consumers took our calls. All five never knew there was a lawsuit in their name. DNS Auto Glass told me it uses independent contractors for sales, but it reviews all agreements. And its AOB contracts provide consumers with the best quality glass and installation. The advocate in our story has been investigating these rates for a very long time. It's something that was rather pernicious in property insurance cases in Florida, and we fought and we got that reform. Unfortunately, a little exception was created by the auto glass industry 
for their benefit. And so this problem still exists in the auto glass context. Well, right now we're in Orlando at the, the home of a guy named Paul who has been dealing with a, an insurance situation where he's got a little bit of an older home and he's had his insurance canceled a couple of different times. Yeah, I guess if you want to yeah, talk to us how long you've lived here and why did you move into this house here? Yeah, so we moved here uh, to our house in 2013, right before our uh, my oldest daughter started high school, so she'd go to Boone High School. Um, and we love the neighborhood. In, in all your years, had you ever had an issue with your insurance being dropped or canceled and, and, or anything like that? No, we've owned a home now. Our other home we owned for 16 years, and now this one we've owned for nine years and have never had an issue prior to this of insurance canceling. In all those years, he never had his homeowner's insurance canceled until the middle of last year. It's now been canceled three times, most recently because of the age of his roof. It's a slope that goes into a flat roof, and that's like the main room. He realizes at 15 years old, the roof is nearing the end of its life. Yeah, when we were shopping it around, what we found is that many companies won't insure older homes. This home was built in 1952. It's a great house, uh, and but many companies just won't insure older homes, and so my options are limited uh, in terms of how many companies would even consider insuring uh, a home of this age. I first thought that this could potentially be a story because this is something that happened to me. Um, my insurance company decided that it was going to uh, limit its exposure here and decided to not renew our insurance. And when I was shopping around for insurance, I ran into the same situation as Paul, that a lot of the insurance companies did not want to insure me because I had an older roof. And if they were going to insure me, the prices were literally going to be through the roof. And, and they're trying to get that bill passed because there's no way around the other scenario. We interviewed Diana Duran, and she's an insurance agent who's run her business here for more than 20 years. And what was interesting is she was telling us a little bit about all the claims that the insurance companies are dealing with that's potentially causing this problem here. What has been going on as far as the number of people getting canceled or renewed? It has been overwhelming, Jeff, uh, for the last couple of years, and I've been trying to warn so many of the public um, about what's coming. She says there's been a flood of claims, mostly for new roofs and lawsuits against the insurance company. There are over 380 lawsuits being filed to property homeowner insurance carriers in the state of Florida a day. Some of those claims are from storms, but some are from roofers who go door to door telling homeowners they have damage and convincing them to file claims for roof replacements. The lawsuits come after claims are denied. Last year, by the third quarter, which was around September, insurance carriers had already paid out over $2 billion in homeowner insurance claims without a hurricane in the state of Florida. Attorneys who win cases can collect up to 30 times the claim amount in fees. Duran says that has put some insurers out of business and many others are either pulling out of Florida or looking to limit their risk, especially when it comes to roofs. It's become a real issue. People are getting non-renewed or they're being told, have you replaced your roof prior to the renewal? If not, you have one year to replace it in some cases. So it's becoming increasingly more difficult for insurance companies to be able to absorb that risk. She says some companies will no longer insure a home with a roof that's more than 10 years old. We went to go talk to Doug Wallace. He's a guy who really has a lot of knowledge about roofs. He worked in the roofing industry for quite a while and then I think he told us about 35 years ago he started his own roofing consulting company where they actually go out and inspect roofs and uh, often served as uh, witnesses and experts in the field. I have inspected over 50,000 roofs and stopped counting. What's happening now he says is unprecedented with real hurricane and other storm claims and what he believes are many fraudulent roof claims in recent years, he understands why insurers are doing what they're doing. We look at them all the time, they don't need to be replaced. They have minimally five, six, eight years left in them and the people are being put in a financial situation where they have to come up with fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 for a roof and it's, it's very tough. I thought that was a really interesting perspective because it tells you that uh, the homeowners are the ones who are having to shell out money for a new roof when perhaps they actually still have life left in the roof. People like Paul Alexander who have to pay out of pocket for a new roof immediately just so they can find a company to insure their homes. Yeah, I just signed a contract yesterday to buy a brand new roof 
um, and I'm trying to get it on as quick as possible so that hopefully I can stay insured. I think it is an important story because it shows what's going on and uh, people that we talk to, not just Doug, but even the insurance agents are saying this is kind of an unprecedented time. They've never seen anything like this where they're having to deal with uh, all these issues where people aren't being covered, uh, where roofs still have life left in them, where the homeowners are the ones ultimately in the end that are having to pay the bill. We were being priced out, you know, by the, you know, the commercial corporations coming in with cash buying these residential homes. Transparency is so important. We're not in the back pockets of people. Eyewitness News uh, prides itself on being fair, accurate, and balanced, and that's what we bring to you every single day and we should be transparent. You should know where we get our information from. You should see us question officials and question the leaders in our community. So we're here in Oviedo today talking to a home buyer. His name is Marcus. He and his fiance have been looking for a home since October of last year. In that time frame, they say that they have bid on between 15 and 20 homes, seen around 30 homes, and over and over they just got outbid. When you first started this process, what, what did you think? Were you optimistic, thinking it would be fairly easy to find a home? Yes, it was a um, emotional roller coaster, really, because uh, at first we were putting in these bids, and we were even going above asking price at the beginning. Uh, but we were being priced out, you know, by the you know the commercial corporations coming in with cash buyer, you know, cash buying these residential homes. He kept a folder of some of the 30 or so homes that they visited during their six-month search from Winter Park to Chuliota. How frustrating is that? That you you know you put your life savings toward this goal of buying a home and you're competing against a corporation that has, you know, a bottomless pocket, basically. It, it was very frustrating. It was um, very discouraging, rather, because then it was like, you know, we found another house and we would put a bid on that and we would walk away from putting the bid on the table or the offer on the table and we would walk away and Heather and I looked at each other and was like, we're going to get we're gonna get outbidded on that onto the next. And that's with our live offer on the table. Well, in this situation, I think anybody who's trying to buy into this market right now can relate to the idea that you're putting in multiple offers. You're getting outbid over and over and over again. You're going over your budget just to try to get in the door to a new home. And uh, this is a story that is not unique to Marcus and his fiance. It's something that a lot of people are going through right now in Central Florida. Daryl Fairweather is Redfin's chief economist. We drilled down the company's data and found the disparity is even worse in some of our predominantly black communities. Well, after the last housing bubble burst, we made it very difficult for people with less than perfect credit or um, patches in their job history to qualify for loans. And oftentimes that's been black and brown people who haven't been able to access mortgages the same way that white people have been able to, and then they end up with the only option being renting. And so that, I guess, leads into the gentrification of those communities. Yes, anytime that you have more renters than homeowners, gentrification is a risk in terms of displacement, in terms of being people priced out of where they can live. We talk about the way that people are being priced out of those neighborhoods. This shows the exact process of how that's happening. The investors are coming in, they're purchasing the homes that maybe would have been affordable to families who have been born and raised in those communities um, and making that goal of home ownership out of reach for a lot of people. In 32805, which includes Paramore and Washington Shores, the population is more than 70% black. And last year, 45% of homes sold were purchased by investors. In 32839, Holden Heights and Millennia, where three quarters of the population is black or brown, saw 37% of homes sold to investors. Those sales could price people out of the neighborhoods that they've called home. Anyone looking to buy a home in Central Florida is competing against them, and anyone looking to rent may be calling them landlord. Investors are sweeping up properties in our area faster than almost anywhere else in the country. Orlando is, you know, it's just getting bigger. New Yorker Christopher Mayo is one of those investors exclusively eyeing Orlando. 
And so right now I have about 11 properties of my own personal um, and I'm managing almost 20 right now for other individual investors as well. Nine Investigates went over data compiled by Redfin, which found Orlando was among the top 10 metros in the country for investor purchases last year, with at least 11,740 properties in 2021, about 22% of all the homes sold. Do you ever feel like, uh, I don't want to call you a villain, but uh, do you ever feel like you're, you're part of the, the housing crisis? We were here in Winter Park today talking to Christine. She's a real estate agent who told me that her clientele has sort of shifted over the last year or two. She's representing a lot more investors now. And some of these people have never stepped foot in the properties that she helps them buy. A perfect example is a property I listed in Waterford Lakes last September. Uh, we had 10 to 12 offers. Uh, we received a cash offer from a conglomerate property management company uh, for $25,000 over list price and was being very flexible with the seller. Real estate agent Christine Elias has seen it all. She's represented buyers like Mayo on investment deals and regular home buyers trying to compete. She says in many cases, neither stand a chance against larger corporate investors dominating the market. It really is about rental rates. We are We still have some of the highest rental rates, not only in our state, but in the country. Though the Fed has taken steps to cool the market with increasing interest rates, steps to reduce massive increases in rental prices have failed. And because we don't have any uh, rent stabilization controls, we don't have any sort of government involvement in protecting consumers, protecting renters from price gouging on rent prices, the market is just charging whatever it wants because it can. State Representative Carlos Guillermo Smith supported rent control measures both at a state and local level, but says our government is now a bystander in the ongoing crisis. State government can't just back away and say, this is not my problem to solve. We have no role here. Government is supposed to protect Floridians from price gouging, from this housing crisis that we're having right now. And in this post-pandemic world where people no longer need to live where they work, warm weather locations like Florida, with the added bonus of no state income tax, will continue to be hot, meaning investors aren't going anywhere. Do you ever feel like, uh, I don't want to call you a villain, but uh, do you ever feel like you're, you're part of the, the housing crisis? I don't think so, because I know when to, you know, I'm capped to a certain limit on a property. Um, you have the corporations that are not capped. So I would say maybe less of a villain if anyone wanted to call me a villain. Well, I think there's a couple different takeaways. I think on one hand, anybody who's trying to buy in this market right now can relate to this issue. Um, it speaks to uh, the frustration that maybe you have saved and squirreled away money for years and years and years to try to get into a property. And right now that's just, it seems impossible because of the investors that are coming in with cash and outbidding you on these homes over and over and over again. Uh, the other, I guess, wider angle look at this um, and what interests me as an investigative reporter is how this is leading to maybe the demise of some of our communities where families are now being priced out of the communities that they have lived in their entire lives. Once those prices go up and families who've lived there for a long time can no longer afford to live there, that really changes the character uh, and the look and feel of those communities. And I think that that's something everybody should be paying attention to. We're not new to the party. We've been doing this for decades. And whether it's me that's presenting the news or my predecessors, the one thing that you can count on is that you can count on us. We didn't just come to this profession. It has been decades in the making. We have watched Orlando grow. We have watched Central Florida grow. And we're a part, I believe, an important part of the community.